This is a Chad Media special report on the crisis in Afghanistan. I'm your host, Jennifer Rash. Joining me is Dr. Mark Morris, Director of Refugee Memphis, which is part of a new Sin Relief Center in the Memphis area. And De Pastor David Pyman, who is pastor of Afghan Church of Memphis and a church planner with Mid-South Baptist Association. Thank you both for joining us. Good to be here. Okay, well, we're all watching, the world is watching um, all that's happening in Afghanistan. And you all are um, very involved, we're already involved in um, work with Afghans. So tell us a little bit about what you've been doing, what you do now, and then we'll get into um, how we can be thinking about what's happening around the world. Yeah. Well, most of all, we've been hearing reports and, and David has been on the phone and Skype and other means talking to uh, Afghan Christians who are, are asking the Lord for guidance and direction. Some just a few days ago registered with the, with the government in, in the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. They registered as Christians and, and, uh, and they willingly did so uh, ready to, to give their lives for Christ. And so that's the sort of attitude that they bring to this. These are leaders of church movements within the nation of Afghanistan and really all over uh, Afghanistan. Uh, those house churches have a, have a broad reach. And now uh, those same people are, are uh, just seeking the Lord's direction, still with that same willingness to, to give their lives for him, but now wondering what is best for us. Is it to try to flee? Is it just to hide? And How do we serve the church? Uh, that's what they're asking. And that's what we're asking as well. Pastor David, yeah, what's your story? Yeah, what you mentioned that when the way they give willingly, like it's not not a few people, it's a lot of people now they are facing. But specifically, what Brother Mark Morris says that uh, specifically about three of them, three of the leaders, their photos and pictures and around the country, the Taliban searching for them. We are desperately uh, try to help them and to bring them out of the country. Uh, that's that our prayer, you know, like because um, of course they want to stay willingly, but they we know that if they stay there, they, they cannot do anything, and that's why we encourage them to, you know, leave the country for now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So okay, tell us a little bit about the Afghan community there in Memphis. Yeah, of course the Afghan community here is mostly Muslim. <clears throat> there are a handful of <clears throat> there are a handful of full of followers of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. who came out of a Muslim background. Mm -hmm. There are Hazara ethnic ethnic Afghans. There are Pashtu uh, uh, ethnic Hazara. There are, there are people from many from the mountains from the city uh, who uh, have each been on a different refugee pilgrimage. Some through India, some through Sri Lanka, some. Uh, through Indonesia and um, but and what Turkey and Turkey and and so they all have a different struggle. Most of them, it's been many many years of of trying to find a better place for them and their families. We have a number of widows here that whose husbands were killed by the Taliban, and they came through Iran, through Turkey, to different places and arrived after many years into uh, this city. So, and that's just true city upon city in the United States, Europe, Canada, uh, that's sort of the plight of the Afghan refugee. So what is it like for them? Uh, I'm sure you're engaging with this community. What is it like for them watching this? I mean, I know what it's like for us to watch it, but I cannot imagine for an, uh, someone who is from the country to watch. Yeah, it's horrible. It's heart bleeding, you know. Their heart is bleeding when you go to them and they just easily start crying and try to share their pain with you. And uh, that's the simple. It's not easy because all of them have someone back in Afghanistan and all of them have family there. And then, of course, they have been experienced there as well. That's why they move here. They run away here. They experience, but they, their experience kind of like <clears throat> renew again. And they remember their own pain now. And they knew what's going on there. And so many things we see on the news, but all of us, not 
not all of them is reality. The reality is more horrible when, um, when we think about that because we face, we, we saw those uh, problem in our eye and then we run and we, we, we came here. Mm. Yeah, I remember last night I was speaking to a lady who she and her family, in fact, we were in Pakistan when she and her family fled the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. And they came uh, just with nothing to Pakistan. Uh, and they left their home in Kabul, Afghanistan. Uh, she was uh, trained in the University of Kabul. She was preparing to be a doctor. And then she arrived in Pakistan with her brother and sister and mother and father with nothing. As she is experiencing this, she, is, she, she was sharing with us last night. I remember it's like I'm living it all over again. And I'm thinking about the little girls, the little children that have been playing in the streets, have been going to school, and they've had freedom that they will never have again in that nation. And so she's just reliving that. Others are calling and saying, uh, Brother Mark, could you please... Is there anything to be done for my my brother that's in uh, the mountains? The Taliban has taken their village. Is there anything that we can do? And and we're we're helpless as far as those kinds of tangible things, other than just to listen and show the love of Christ. What is the reality for women and young girls in Taliban now? Through the with the Taliban and in Afghanistan now. Yeah, the reality they cannot go out without any man, and the reality they cannot study that. And simply, they don't have any freedom. No more freedom for uh, girls and women in Afghanistan. Yeah, of course, Taliban send the news so many promise, but that's not the true. And we know that what they are doing. Mm. Yeah, we know what they are doing there now. And especially one of uh, men, a few days, uh, I, I can say that two weeks ago, he called me and said, uh, about two weeks ago, and and he cried, and his daughter took by Taliban, his 14 years daughter took by Taliban, and and ripped in front of him. That's horrible. You cannot, we cannot even image, you know, mm -hmm. and how painful is that? And uh, yeah, it's like. On that time, I cannot tell him anything when he called me. He said, please pray. Please pray that. And he came out of the city and he lived his, his, his two children and wife in another city. And he'd go back to find his daughter. And then he came back hopeless. Mm. And there is another pain. Mm. But now we don't know where they are now. And those, those story is, is reality. Mm. Something we cannot see in the news. Something we cannot hear from news. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And this is a follower of Jesus who, who was whose daughter was was taken and raped in front of him by the Taliban. Mm. You know, uh, we we sometimes speak of persecution and how we feel like we might be being persecuted in a various mm. ways. But I think about what you're saying, Pastor, Rick, that. This, these things, things are happening, and this is really this is real persecution. And I wonder why why are the stories not being told? Yeah, that's a question that's hard for us to answer. Um, you know, we but I guess that's why we're here is to tell those stories. And uh, the most important thing, of course, is is in that place in places like that, uh, people make a decision for Christ after weighing. The, the consequences and really considering they know that when they choose to follow Jesus, that they, they, I, I remember people that were considering this saying to me, you know, if I do this, I won't be able to get a job. I won't be able to get married. There will be no place to bury me. I will have, I'll be cut off from my family. I'll have no, what will I do during the celebrations? What will I, wh you know, where will I go? And so they know that they are completely rejecting, uh, this kingdom for the kingdom of God, and and uh, often they uh, they they literally lose their lives because of the decision to follow Jesus. You know, I've heard um, Christians in other closed countries like this um, mention that the prayer they want is 
for us to pray for them to be able to have strength and sustain and to um, persevere. Do you see that as a, a prayer request now as well? That we uh, yeah, of course. But uh, I want to ask uh, what you said that why it's not going in. You know, like mm -hmm. of course, like we live in the sinful earth and the sinful world. You know, like um, we know that from the second coming of Jesus, he still is suffering is there. Is his reality? We cannot deny the suffering is not denied. It's biblical, and whoever follows Jesus, he gets suffering. And 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 then also this suffering affect all people. The sin affect all the the life of people in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what's your next question? You said that, is it a prayer uh, point for people to pray? Of course, um, mm -hmm. we request to pray. Please lift them up in your prayer that the, the people can see the reality of the sin, the reality of the darkness, the reality of the religions, the reality of what's going on in uh, Afghanistan and, and all, all over the world. You know, uh, we, were, we were together in a retreat uh, with Afghan Christians on the days, the very weekend when the Taliban was taking over Kabul. And we happened to be studying through uh, the plagues. We were just, as a church, reading through Exodus, and we happened to come to the plagues, and so that's what we that's what we studied. And as we were reading, we were, we were seeing how uh, Pharaoh, uh, at, at, during those first five plagues, he's, sometimes he's hardening his heart. Sometimes we just know that his heart is hard. And then during those last five plagues, you know, it, it, during some of them, Pharaoh hardened his heart. During others, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And so we're asking, why would you, why God would you harden Pharaoh's heart? And then uh, one of the Afghan brothers chimed in. He says, uh, Pastor Mark, remember that Nicodemus was the most wicked king on earth mm -hmm. and one of the most wicked uh, nations of Babylon on earth. And yet God called Nebuchadnezzar my servant. Mm -hmm. And he said, surely God is calling the Taliban his servant. And that's a hard mm -hmm. lesson for us to hear. Mm -hmm. But we have to believe that God is orchestrating all the events of history. And we believe that he's doing that. Uh, to advance his kingdom in ways that we can't comprehend right now. But surely just as God uh, strengthened and advanced the kingdom of God in China during those days of persecution, we've got to trust and believe that God is good, that he loves his people, and that he is building his king, his kingdom in Afghanistan through extraordinary means. Well, you know, um, Afghanistan is uh, currently number two on the um, world watch list from open doors the um, country where the most difficult it's most difficult to be a christian according to their survey just mm -hmm. under uh north korea do you think that all of that maybe that's happening there um as you were describing how god's working in all of this as well will that um increase for christians or is it a basically what it's always been. I mean, is this, is this going to make it worse? I know it's going to make it worse for the people in general. Correct. What about specifically for Christians as we're talking about that, how the persecution is happening and what might be happening there? Of course, it's become worse there. And it's not a good news. And we can see. But about the increasing uh, Christian, of course, yes. Mm. And Christian will grow there. And it's, it's already proof that from the Bible, we can see that persecution will bring faith, strong faith, and they can share gospel. I mean, yesterday, I, I talked to two girls in, in Kabul. I said, what's, uh, what's your plan? They said, no, we're going to stay in our country. We're going to share gospel with Taliban, wow. with women. We will get more chance to meet women to share the reality of hope, the real, the, the real hope and the real life of Jesus for them. That's what people have patience for, for their country. Uh, it's, it doesn't mean that when, when there is persecution, all people coming out. No, many people are exciting to stay there and share gospel with, with, even with Taliban. And they knew that Taliban is, uh, is not their enemies. The enemies is, is the darkness. Use Taliban against. And they want to pray and show the, the face of God and the love of God and, and the hope of God. Mm -hmm.
And like you mentioned at the beginning, Mark, about the, the fact that they took that bold step to actually register. And who knew that this many weeks later, that list yeah. would be in the hands of different leaders now. So, wow. Yeah, yes. So now the Taliban, they have those lists and they have, uh, you know, these, he mentioned three brothers and their families that uh, have been trying to, to leave because, you know, almost against their, their will, but uh, they, uh, their pictures are, are plastered around Kabul. And so they are, they are, uh, they're targeted and there's others like that. But so, yeah, th it's hard for us to comprehend. It's hard for us to know how to help. And so people that love Afghanistan and want to be there helping are having to regroup. Now we got also have to remember that, that God has been working among Afghans and in Afghanistan for many generations for, you know, since he came. And uh, so God has been at work. You know, we, we go back and we look at the, the Nestorian Christians that, you know, there were a segment of them that were heretics, but there were others that were there in the north of Afghanistan. I remember visiting a city in the north called Balk. And it was, if you read history, you see that there was a bishop of Balk uh, and there were uh, Christians. There's a city called Herat, where there is a, a street that is named uh, Believer Street, you know, and uh, uh, Injil, or actually New Testament Street. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's there's remnants. And even in the carpets, there are uh, the Turkmen carpet weavers uh, learn from the Nestorians of the symbol of, of three crosses on a hill. And you see that in their carpets and you see the ictus, the, the fish of the symbol in the carpets. And, and Afghans don't even know what those are. And God gives us the opportunity to tell them, you know, that's not three X's. That's, let me tell you a story of the three crosses on the hill. And do you know why there's this fish? And, and you tell the story about how when Jesus was, was here, that that was, or, and the followers, early followers of Jesus would use that, that ictus symbol to, indicate in a very sort of secret way that they were also followers of Jesus Christ. So, so yeah, God is not starting his work all over. He's been working there for a long time. I, guess. Okay. I mean, what, what you asking like about uh, uh, registering as a Christian there, it's, it's like kind of many pastor have been called me and said, what they did is stupid things. But I said, uh, I cannot say that because there's another step of faith. There is another step of faith you cannot understand. They choose, it's not somebody forced them to do that. It's uh, 39 uh, families, they already got their identity. And then 140, they already registered, but they, they, there wasn't process. The Taliban came. 500 believers, they are willingly want to do that. They are willingly to want to do that. This is another step of faith because they don't want their generation called as a Muslim name. They want their generation, their children called as a Christian in Afghanistan, because Afghanistan has a story of Christian and they don't want to, that story dead there, you know, living dead there. They want to give life to, to the story that uh, Afghanistan has belonged to God. Afghanistan has belonged to Christ. And that's another step of faith. I, I say, I always say that. Yeah. And many people like uh, me and, and other uh, folks outside of Afghanistan were begging them not to do that, not to register, but but they insisted. Yeah. Wow, that's some impressive faith for sure. And I think about um, you know this the amazing uh, responsibility that we have to be praying and to be um, to remembering our brothers and sisters there, and then to think about so many of the people who are not believers and the opportunities. Um, in their fear that maybe they can find mm -hmm. Christ in all of this too, with the believers who will be there um, mm -hmm. still trying to share and be a light. What are some um, ways as well, along with our prayer, what are some ways to help um, for the ones who will be able to um, get out of the country, some refugees here possibly? I know there's lots being discussed about that right now, but are there some mm -hmm. practical things that churches and Christians here can do if and when that that starts happening? Yeah, uh, one thing we need to recognize is that is that to serve people from most other countries, mm -hmm. it takes time. Mm -hmm. So the most powerful thing often that we can do is go spend 30 minutes or an hour 
having tea in the home of someone like that in need. Now, for us, that feels that's frightening. But but uh, for someone from all parts of Asia, Central Asia, you know, we as Americans, we worship time. That's the American idol is time. We measure our life in minutes and seconds and, and you know, sometimes 30 minutes block, an hour block, that's too long. Right. But, but we've got to recognize that that this is a relational ministry of, of life on life sharing Christ. So, so I think that's, that's one of the things we need to recognize is be willing to give of your time to build a relationship to the, the foreigner among us, regardless of what nationality he or she is. And so that's one thing I would, I would encourage also, uh, you know, we, we have a website, refugeememphis.com where people can go and give and learn about refugee needs uh, there are. I'm. I was told yesterday that Send Relief is is has a fund that is raising support and in partnership with International Mission Board to help refugees and and so you know we plan on calling upon those those resources and and so yeah the, I think those just practically be willing to get your hands dirty and build a relationship uh, with those that you see be willing to give sacrificially but then to Praying and fasting. The Bible talks about praying and fasting, and and we don't really do that very well. And so, if there's a time to pray and fast, uh, if we care about, if we really care, then this would be a good time to pray and fast because moment by moment, there are Afghan followers of Jesus that are that are struggling with what to do and how to do it, and and there seems to be no means. There's also Muslims. Uh, Nearly every Afghan is struggling with how to care for their family. How, how does their how do they survive another day? They've lost their income. They don't have a way to earn to have food on the table. They're afraid to go out on the streets. And so there's just so much human suffering that's happening right now. There's a lot to pray for. What would you think? How can people pray? Yeah, a lot to say is okay. Um, good. Good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can I can see how we could easily um, watch the news a couple of times a day and get our, our hearts would be pulled and we would be upset and we might even be frustrated and and chat about it everywhere we go but i hear what you're saying mm-hmm. if we really if we really want to make a difference if we're really that concerned we need to yeah. we need to put this into prayer yeah mm-hmm. our energy there and our time and I, you know that's an excellent point too about um taking the time and then i think about the people that are here the communities that are here that are that are upset watching all of this happen, even taking the time to listen and to mm. comfort them. That's another another way to reach out. So. That's right, that's right. Okay. I've also been made aware that our soldiers, that our families of the soldiers of America, you know, they they feel they, they're struggling. Oh, wow. and so, uh, you know, just, uh, it, it, it's a, it, we need to care for them. We need to let them know that what they sacrificed was, was not worthless. We have heard of stories of, of well, you even in your own story, uh, your best one, of, your best friend received a Bible from a soldier, and exactly, and uh, that was key in your salvation story. Yeah, the soldier you used by for my testimony, like I came to Christ because someone gave Bible to some soldier give Bible to one of my Afghan friends. Oh. Wow, wow. And the, the circles and the connections. That's amazing. That is and in the military, I know too that um what you're saying has to be heavy on their hearts because um all the 20 years of service and work, um, different people being there and having invested in the communities there, that this has to be a difficult time for our military community, you're right. That's right. Yeah, like even though like we hear, we heard many news that oh, uh, twenty years of America uh, spent time spent money in Afghanistan is useless, and of course they use a lot of money, they use a lot of time, but that's not useless, and we should encourage our brother and sister that who are give their life and went to Afghanistan. That's not useless at all. We can see that people don't want to uh, go under the Taliban because they see something different. They want the freedom. They want to live free. And that's not useless. That's very mean to us. Mean to Afghan people. Meaningful. Meaningful, yeah. Yeah. 
Wow. And I love that, 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 that Bible made its way to you. That's so fantastic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, well, Pastor David and Dr. Mark, thank you both. Um, thank you for what you're doing. Um, thank you for helping us understand. And um, uh, I just appreciate you both. Thank you. And uh, we'll hope to talk to you again soon. Well, we appreciate Alabama Baptist for your prayers and your, and your services. What, one thing that you'll be interested in is many years ago, I remember that Alabama Baptist sent boxes of food to a project in Iran. And, oh. and when they saw those boxes, what they saw was Allah Bama. What does that mean? God is, God is with me. Then in, in, in their <laughs> language, God is with me. And so, uh, yes, remember that God is with you and we're grateful for what God is doing for you. Love that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Yeah.